we put you on the map. This is Ron Costa broadcasting live in the Mappable USA studios in Las Vegas. And today, folks, we're going to talk about real estate. We're going to talk about a topic that we, we brought up a couple of podcasts back and generated a lot of questions, and that's the 1031. So before we get into this whole thing, let's bring in Vicky Hutchmala from the World Token Market and the QOZ Marketplace. Vicky, how are you today? I'm fabulous today, Ron. Another excellent day in Vegas. We have two exciting guests on our podcast this morning, and we're going to uh, delve into Opportunity Zones and 1031 Exchanges. So I can't wait. Amongst many other topics, too. We went to an event last night, and that's all everyone was talking about, the 1031 Exchanges. So this timing is really great. So, okay, so let's bring in our guest today. Uh, folks, we've got two people from Madison 1031 today. Uh, we've got Mike Scotchless and Alex Sandrovsky. Alex is the business development, a senior business development, and, in, and, and Mike is in uh, the, the tax uh, counsel of, of the company. Guys, how are you doing today? We're doing really, doing really great. well. Thanks for having us on. Okay, yeah, great. It's yeah, thanks nice for taking the time Jersey. out. Yeah, it's a- <laughs> Yeah, it takes a while for that uh, the the voice from Jersey to travel all the way to Vegas. It works well. But, uh, <laughs> glad you guys took <laughs> glad you guys took the time out to be on our podcast today. And I know we're going to be talking about something really interesting on the 1031 exchanges and and, uh, and how that whole happened. So so before we get started into this whole uh, conversation, why don't you go through your background and let us know let our audience know how you got to be where you are today. Sure. So I'll start off. I feel like Mike and I are kind of the odd couple because my background is I'm in a small business space. I, I founded a successful catering company in Silicon Valley, and uh, I, I made all the mistakes of being a small business owner that uh, scaled a, a business from $3,000 to several million dollars in revenue, multiple employees. And uh, what I learned when I was kind of researching about the individuals who have really built multi-generational wealth, I learned more and more about real estate, which got me very interested in mass 1031 and 1031 exchanges, so which I found to be an effective way and tool to be able to build a, you know, a, multifam- a multi-generational wealth. So that's a little bit of my story. Mike? Uh, so I was a... Um... A, I started as a auditor in a CPA, moved on to law school and became a tax attorney. And, uh, you know, I saw the opportunity to become tax counsel, 1031. As one of my mentors said, uh, he couldn't believe that I had the opportunity to only focus on one one uh, one section of the code instead of the whole code. Uh, and, you know, I've seen people in my family do very well with real estate got involved in uh, Madison 1031, the whole real estate industry, real estate taxes, and uh, here I am. No, that's great. Uh, uh, so let's start off on a very ground level on this. Uh, the 1031, what, what is it exactly? How does, that, how does that help a real estate investor? Absolutely. So I'll, I'll start off with this. So the example I love to use is imagine – Uncle Sam as that strange uncle at every party, right? So Uncle Sam is with you, and every time that you invest, he's there with you, co-investing with you. Now, when you are ready to take money out of the market and sell the property, and you're thinking about cashing out, well, Uncle Sam shows up at that closing meeting and says, look, as soon as you take this money out, I'm going to need my 25 to 30 33%, depending where you're at, which stage you're in. I'm going to need you to give that money to me. But... Because you've done so well in this investment, I want you to continue being in the market, right? Like in Las Vegas, I know you have people are going to say, I want you to continue playing the, uh, the, the, you know, the blackjack, stay in the game. So he <laughs> says to us, you know, keep staying in the game. I want you to keep the money in. And what I'm going to do is a 1031 exchange. And this tool is going to allow you to defer capital gains tax as long as you reinvest the money, all the money from that, um, from that sale into an exchange property. And there are limitations, which we'll discuss with that, but that's the concept here is that Uncle Sam says, you've done so well, I want you to keep the money inside of the real estate market, keep the money moving, and I'm going to give you the tax deferral benefit of reapplying that money into a new property. Okay. All right. And then as as long as you keep uh, reinvesting it, you, you don't have to pay taxes to Uncle Sam then, right? Exactly. There's going to be limitations that we're going to discuss, but that's the basic concept. Absolutely. I got it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that sounds good. 
Well, you know, the, the uh, example of Vegas probably wasn't a good one because the more you play the tables, the more you lose. But I hear what you're saying on, on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Which so, we just, love, just, actually. <laughs> and, and 1031 is named the 1031 exchange because that is the section of the IRS code. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. And yeah, probably one. once, the, yeah, which probably has like, you know, thousands of pages too, but uh, unbelievable. Um, so, okay. So, so in other words, the, the 1031 exchange, uh, you mentioned earlier, you used the phrase generational wealth. Uh, so what, what do you, what do you mean by that? So, what, what the 1031 does is it makes you reinvest the proceeds into more real estate. Uh, and not only that, but in order to defer all of your tax, you must uh, buy equal to or more in value for your other real estate. So most of the times you actually see people investing up. Uh, so you're taking this money that you otherwise would give to Uncle Sam. And let's say, you know, you sold a million dollar building and you had like $500,000 in gains that would have been $200,000 in taxes. That $200,000 now is going back into your next building, which may be, you know, two, two and a half or $3 million. And if you use leverage plus the amount of money Uncle Sam just let you for free, uh, you start getting bigger and bigger and bigger and more and more uh, wealth and real estate and, uh, and, and income. That, that gives you real generational wealth, as Alex likes to say. I got it, and, yeah. And, 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 and exactly one of the things that's important to note is when you're doing a 1031 exchange, you're still, still keeping that original basis of the first property that, that you sold. So you're carrying on, right? You're deferring the tax debt. But imagine you get, say, you do a 1031 exchange, this is where we see a lot of multi-generational, we, we see with a lot of investors, you keep doing 1031 exchanges, right? So they're kind of kicking the can down the line and until the point, that, and they established one of them, until the point where they're able to give it over to their inheritors. They pass away and they give over the property to that inheritor. And what happens is that only the, the stepped up basis, the last basis of the, pro, of the property that you purchased, that's going to be the difference between what the, for, when you sell a property, that's going to be the, now the original basis. So again, it almost wipes out that uh, deferred uh, tax uh, uh, burden until the last property that you've purchased. So again, that's, yeah, that that's what we really build that multi, that's, that's what I mean by multi-generational is that that is the greatest gift that an individual can give to his inheritors. Uh, yeah, so, so what does, we say, it, does it impact your heirs when, uh, if you have a 1031 uh, asset it, and you pass on, your heirs are not impacted tax-wise? It just continues not, forever? Yeah, not at all. What we say in the industry is you swap, meaning you do a 1031 exchange swap, you drop because then uh, let's say there's even no basis left after you know after this guy's had buildings for 45 years 50 years uh, the second he dies you get a step up in basis to the value the fair market value of the date of death oh my god so really if, if the heir sold that 10 million dollar building with a zero basis the next day they'd have zero gain mm. Yeah, that, good. that point Pretty alone cool. is huge. Yeah, that's that's a, that's a great, especially if you live in a in a place that is really appreciated. Like let's say you know you're in California, for example, and uh, you know what, 40 years ago you you bought something, you kept rolling it over, and uh, you know in 20 years you die, you probably have a huge amount of stuff, and that that's that's all exactly. uh, deferred. That's that, that, that's incredible. That that is a great tool, exactly. no question. Exactly. Yeah. And that's multi generational wealth, exactly. Yep. Yeah. So so I guess I guess the 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 key here. For a successful 1031, though, is you have to replace it with another property. So you have to be able to find a property that not only fits your uh, your your uh, the amount that you need to invest, but it has to pencil out as well. Right? You don't want to 1031 to a bad project because that would defeat the whole purpose of making money, right? Yeah. The first thing I tell people is don't don't let the tax uh, tail wag the dog of the entire transaction. Meaning. Just because you have a 1031, you know, it, it might be better to blow the 1031 and pay the taxes than get into a bad deal. Uh, yeah. So def definitely don't let the tail wag the dog. But again, you know, if, if you know, there's a lot of deals out there. And uh, I mean, we could talk in a minute about the uh, identification of what you have to identify and when. But uh, 
definitely don't get into a bad deal because even the tax ramifications will make sense for it. Yeah. All right, well, let's say I'm, I'm out here in Las Vegas and I have a medical building that I own and I'm going to sell it. And it's already, you know, I got an offer on it and I'm going to accept the offer. So now I'm going to sell my medical building uh, and it's going to be, let's say, I'm going to sell it for a million dollars just to throw a word out there. Um, what's, what's my next step? I, obviously, I got to start identifying, right? Or do, or do I do okay. that before I sell the property? All right. So, so the, so the, the first one, one and we, yeah, Mike, Mike and I always say is the first thing you should do is, is contact the qualified intermediary, right, which is someone like Mass and 1031, which is going to be because the notion that we need to realize the only way that 1031 exchange works is if you have to keep the money in the market. So if you actually sell the property and you close the property, you sell that property, and that money hits your bank account, you can no longer do a 1031 exchange. One of the top Ooh. top reasons that we have people calling us really despondent is they call and they say, look, I, you know, I already received the money. What can I do now? And the reality is, again, the 1031 exchange has to be done through a qualified intermediary. That cannot be your person. It cannot be your uh, your personal lawyer. It cannot be your broker. It, uh, but it has to be an independent party that's going to be holding the money between the process of the sale to the purchase of the new property. So it's really crucial to, as soon as you have intent to be able to sell the property, if you feel like it makes sense for you to defer taxable gain on that property, really important to each other is qualified intermediary. Um, and also really important to understand is if you have a property that you share with partners as well, that complicates things a lot more and you want to get be guided by professionals, a lot of experience like individuals like Mike. So before you even sell the property in contemplating the sale, you have to decide whether you want to do the 1031 exchange or sell it outright to make sure that you don't disqualify yourself. Yeah, you got that one. <laughs> You're a good teacher, Al. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Well, yeah, I'm a great teacher. Well, I'm a good learner. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, if, if people just get one thing from this podcast, that is a huge, huge point. Because otherwise, I mean, can you imagine doing the sale, thinking that you're going to get all these tax benefits, and then all of a sudden, you know, they, they, they call Madison 1031, and you guys are like, oh, you know what, I can't help you on this. You, 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 your money wow. hit your account. This is a very expensive lesson uh, that people shouldn't have to deal with. So uh, if, you, if you're listening to this podcast, you got your money's worth already, I'm, I think. This is a huge, <laughs> huge point right there. <laughs> So, okay, so now, uh, in addition to that, there are timing requirements, too, on, on this. So can you guys talk about the timing requirements uh, from, from uh, a, a 1031 perspective? Sure. Mike, do you want to handle the, this part? Okay, so within 45 days of the closing on the first property, uh, you have to identify new replacement property or properties. You can identify uh, one, two, three, and there are some rules you could identify even more. Uh, and then within 180 days of the closing, so it's not 45 plus 180, it's just 180, uh, you have to close on that property. So you have about six months to close on the new property, uh, but those deadlines are hard and fast, you know, especially the 45-day deadline. Uh, by midnight of the 45th day, you have to identify property in writing signed by the secretary. All right, and when you say identify the property, you mean identify it to the QI? Uh, usually to the QI. That's what we prefer. There, you could identify it to another party, um, but, you know, obviously we prefer that it's identified to us so we can make sure it's done in the proper way. Uh, and okay. identified as, as, like, 123 Main Street, uh, Manhattan, New York, not, like, an, an apartment in Manhattan. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, exactly. Okay, and then uh, and then you, what, a <laughs> when when you say identify, though, uh, you're just talking about a property that you're interested in per, proper, uh, pro, uh, purchasing. Maybe like you're not you're not you don't have that that property under under contract yet, right? Or you you could, but you, you don't, you don't you, have to. You could, but you don't have to. And actually, one of the rules is you don't have to identify in writing if you actually purchase it within four or five days. Oh, okay. So, so it could be anywhere in the process. All right. So if, if you uh, are thinking of doing a 1031 exchange, does that new uh, property that you're going to uh, uh, transfer to, does it have to be in the same city or the same state? Can it be anywhere in the country, or is that a restriction? Great question. That's, uh, that's a really, really excellent question. 
excellent question. So uh, as long as it's real property, it can be, it, it can be exchanged, right? So, but it has to be real property of real property inside the United States or real property of real property internationally, right? So you can take a property in the United States, like in Las Vegas, sell it, and then 1031 into somewhere in, in uh, uh, I think, Mon Monaco. I think there's some gambling in Monaco that's happening. Maybe uh, in a, a Monte Carlo, sorry, Monte Carlo, right? That's not going to work. Uh, but what you can do is you can take for, uh, for a studio in Market Street in San Francisco, which is worth a million dollars, and exchange it out for a multifamily unit building in uh, Las Vegas or Kansas City. It's not a problem. So it's again, like kind exchange is very generous, but it has to be real property for real property, but cannot be international, uh, domestic for international. Does it have to be the same class, like a commercial property to a commercial property or residential to residential? No, it can be. Like we planted can, these questions with you. <laughs> yeah, this, this is a great question. Yeah, so it can be exchanged for any class, but it has to be real property. Okay. So your your single family residence could be exchanged in Las Vegas, uh, investment property only, by the way could be exchanged for an industrial building in Alabama or Virginia. So very like kind is very broad in this, in this sense. And so it has to have, be investment uh, property. So I can't, if I sell my house and want to uh, transfer the funds into do a 1031 exchange, uh, can I put that into a house that I want to live in after I move out of this house? No, it's no, got to so be the, investment the property. Code is only for, exactly, only for the purpose of investment properties. So that's that's exactly, and even so, that will also go for individuals who are flipping homes. So if you're flipping a home, you're purchasing for the for the intent of sale rather than investment, which is hold and renting. That would not work either. So that's a, a, a massive question that we get all the time: is you know, I just flipped, the, I just purchased the home, I, I flipped it three months later, I'm ready to sell it. And then when the 1031, where, you know, again, the, the goal of the 1031 exchange is to keep investment properties uh, moving. So it can only be done for the person investment property rather than for sale. Oh, okay. So, you know, um, a lot of our listeners, we talk to them about opportunity zones as well. So can you tell us uh, the difference between a 1031 exchange and investing in an opportunity zone and, and what the trend is at this, at this stage of the game? Yeah, that's, that's great because the opportunity zone legislation is, is fantastic tax legislation. Uh, and hopefully it works to get more money flowing into – these uh, needed uh, property in needed areas. Uh, but the big, I, I'd say the biggest difference is a 1031, um, but I can talk about a few differences. One is with a 1031, you have to reinvest all of your proceeds and not just the gain. With an opportunity zone, you only invest your capital gain. Uh, and one of, the, one of the big pieces, which is slightly deterrent for opportunity zone investors, is you can't invest your, the uh, the depreciation recapture in the opportunity zone, while with the 1031 you can defer the depreciation recapture. Uh, and then I think the third biggest difference is that um, 1031 you can do in all real estate across the country, while an opportunity zone, a you're limited in scope. But B, you're not limited to just real estate. You could be operating businesses and things like that. So they're both tremendous vehicles for tax savings, although the opportunity is only eventually you have to pay the Pied Piper on, on the first sale, but not on the second sale. So. Well, and plus, you they're, know, they're with an great. opportunity zone investment, you have to keep your investment for a long period of time. So if you're an investor and you're uh, working towards your generational wealth, if you're an older person and you invest in an opportunity zone, you may have a difficulty if you don't reach the 10-year period to defer the tax, where a 1031 pretty much eliminates that, that issue. Right, and, and not only that, but with the, the with the opportunity zone, you have to hold it for ten years, and you're only right. deferred for for a maximum of six at this point. 
uh, with the 1031, that could be forever. Yeah. At the end of the of the period for the for the opportunity zone, you know, you're investing in an opportunity zone mm-hmm. fund basically, and at the end of that, uh, what 2026 or whatever it is, uh, you're there, you have to get out of it, I guess, at some point. Is is there any way that you can you can 1031 from a opportunity zone fund into a 1031 exchange so you can avoid paying taxes at the time when the opportunity zone project stops? Uh, so it's a great question. And, and I think the – and no one has an answer yet because no one's actually uh, tried it. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. But the, the, the answer is probably not because with the 1031, as Alex mentioned earlier, uh, because of the uh, tax cuts and job tax, only real estate can be exchanged. So when you, when you have a partnership interest in an opportunity zone fund, you have a partnership interest or a, corp- or, or a stock in, a corporate interest, not – not actual real estate. It doesn't mean that the entity, which is the fund, can't do a 1031 necessarily um, if they want to get out of that specific real estate project. But mm-hmm. uh, otherwise, the individual themselves could not. So right. if, but who if knows? They, in... they may make an exception down the line. If you're in a 10 or you're contemplating a 1031 exchange and you don't follow the the time criteria and it's getting to to the limit, can you then just convert that into uh, an opportunity zone to uh, save the capital gains deferment or vice versa if you're in an opportunity zone and convert it to uh, 1031, can you do either way? You could go one way, but not the other. So it, let's say you sold your million-dollar medical office that you've had for 30 years and you had, you know, $500,000 in gain. You could take that $500,000 if you couldn't identify within 45 days, you know, so your exchange just blows. Then on day 46, go invest it in an Opportunity Zone fund, right? But on the flip side, once you're in an opportunity zone fund, then you're you're not holding real estate anymore. There is no possibility of exchange. Right. Okay. Well, that makes sense. Yeah, no, it does. It does. And uh, let's get back to the timing issue here. On one of these, the uh, question that comes up a lot that I've heard is, if I identify three properties, let's say, can, I mean, can I identify more than three if I have to, or, or is it like just the three? As so the you can identify. You can identify three without any consequences and buy either one, two, or all three. It doesn't really matter. If you want to identify more, there are two rules that you have to fall into. One is the 200% rule, which means the fair market value of all the properties you identify. So let's say you identified five properties after you sold your million-dollar property. The fair market value of those five can't exceed 200%, so $2 million. The other one is, let's say, it does exceed $2 million, you can fall into the 95% rule, which says that you have to identify 95% by value of what you identified. So if you identified five and it's 2.5 million, as long as you buy 95% of what you identified, you're still good too. Okay, Uh, and if I identify these three properties, let's say, at the time I'm identifying these properties are available, but let's say, you know, 10 days goes by and I'm ready to, you know, to, to move forward. You know, let's say all three of these properties are no longer on the market. Uh, is my 1031 toast at this point? If, if day 46 has passed, then yes. Between but if it's day not, zero, can I, re- can I, can I you can re-identify. Properties? Yep. Before, oh, okay. Before that's, that's solved 12 a big PM, problem, man. Yeah, before 12 p.m. on day 45, you can change your uh, identification as often as you want. In writing. All right. So, if for, if for example, uh, you know, you're ready to go, to go, and you're ready to close, and for whatever reason the deal doesn't close, the seller doesn't want to sell anymore, uh, you know, you still have resources as long as it's not past day 45. Yep. Exactly. Okay. And this this is this is uh this is also uh, one of the main reasons that a reverse exchange is sometimes used where it's it's, it's the ability for a person to say, look, I, I, I see this property on the market that I want to purchase, but I'm worried it's going to be gone very quickly, right? And, and I'm not sure if I can sell my property before um, 
a settlement property, identified it, and purchased this one, it might be already off the market. So what some individuals do is the reverse exchange, where essentially they're doing a loan to the QI who purchases the property on the behalf of the of the seller, they, and they'll hold the property for the 180 days to be able to then to, uh, that they'll and they'll almost do the reverse where they will then 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 the seller will sell his original property and then be able to get the deed from the um, uh, from the QI. Now the the negative of that is that you have to give money up front for like almost a bridge loan to the qualified intermediary to purchase the property that you're looking to get, uh, and that's costly. A lot of people don't have that kind of money just lying around. The benefits is as long as you can actually get income prop, income from both uh, properties, then right. So essentially, they can get both the property that was purchased by the QI income, and also the original property is still being held before sale. So you essentially get able, able to get an income from both properties. You're not able to get uh, depreciation. So that's one one tool that individuals use when they just have a property they just love. I just need to have that property, and I can't let it go. Okay, so we recommend doing a first exchange. Let the QI purchase the property, and then uh, essentially wait for the proceeds of the sale that comes through from the original property to uh, be used to switch out and get the deed. So that's another popular tool that's used. Okay. So there's there a lot of flexibility in a 1031 exchange compared to an opportunity zone investment. Yeah, I, I mean, there's definitely within, you know, you could do a reverse, a construction, a forward, and there there is some flexibility. But, you know, the IRS is very generous in some areas. But, you know, if you missed identification, the 45 days at midnight or 180 days, then the consequences are bad. But otherwise, it's a very flexible tool uh, and a very affordable tool as well. Yeah, definitely. It sounds really interesting uh, and certainly is a great resource for investors and everybody. Uh, let me ask you a really top-level top, top level question. Is there any like right or wrong time to actually do an exchange? Is, is market conditions a factor, or is it just a, on, a, on a personal uh, uh, you know, financial statement basis? You know, it's, it's very personal because what, what really matters is how much tax you're going to be able to uh, defer. Because if you're not deferring a lot of tax, or even if you if you have a loss, by the way, you can't get out of it if you already entered into a 1031 exchange. Um, yeah. so, so you're kind of stuck with that uh, repercut those repercussions. But uh, it's very personal. There's no good time. You, you you know if you're you want to stay in the real estate game and you want to keep buying, then I would suggest 1031 if you have gains. Uh, but otherwise, there's no good or bad time to do it as long as you as long as it's a good deal. Do you see movements in the 1031 exchange, uh, exchange market? Do you, do you see it, uh, it in, increasing or decreasing? or what, what's, the, what's the trend right now? I, I see it increasing as, you know, you get more of these podcasts and more of people seeing that 1031 isn't just for the ultra wealthy. It's, you know, uh, I, I can bring it up now. We don't have to talk about it later. But the cost of a 1031, like a, a forward change, is either you know somewhere between 850 in some cases and 1500 on, uh, in other cases. So it's not a lot of money in order to, to defer quite a bit of taxes. So even the average Joe with you know a $150,000 house that he's selling, uh, that he's got $30,000 in gain, it's worth it for him, yeah. without a doubt. So are you seeing uh, uh, more people interested in 1031s because of the state of the economy in general now, that there's more uh, a real estate capital gains to reinvest just because of yeah, the for, state of the economy? Yes, I mean, we're seeing, I mean, from compared to 2008 with the crash, I mean, it's, it's Right now, it's record high. From what I've, what we've heard is, you know, you have up to a fifth of all real estate transactions could be happening to 1031 on the commercial level. So it's really 1031 is really being used because there's so much appreciation has happened over the recent uh, years, and it's 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 an amazing tool that people are tapping into. So absolutely. Yeah. Well, and same with opportunity zones, too. There's more uh, people are earning more money on whatever assets they have. So they now have money to invest in, in an opportunity zone or otherwise, just because people have money now to do stuff with. 
that impacts everybody. Yeah, and the more money that's being kept or pushed into the market, the better it is for everyone. <laughs> Absolutely, sounds sounds great. So, so guys, if people are listening to this podcast right now and they're considering a 1031, they need a QI. Uh, how do they how do they reach you? Uh, Alex the best, the, at Madison1031.com. Yeah, That's the easiest the way. Best way is, <laughs> so you can reach out to me at Alex at Madison1031.com. And, um, and I think the best thing, that the, the reason why we're so popular is that individuals really can gain knowledgeable insights from lawyers and CPAs like Mike and they get, get a lot of insight into is 1031 really the best option. We, we specialize in this and we can really guide a person to understand the numbers behind the decision because that's not always the best option for them. And uh, our interest is making sure that, again, we, we're, long, we're looking to build long-term relationships and uh, if you give us a call, we'll make sure to take care of you and then put all of our research into making sure that this is the right decision for you. Yeah, exactly. And you don't have to be – you could be anywhere in the country. You guys are nationwide, right? Yeah, exactly. We operate nationwide. All right, boy, I, you know, Vicky, should we be on the phone with all our real estate investors after this one? Boy, what a, what a podcast, huh? Absolutely. I think we need to. Unbelievable information. You know, you guys, you guys were great. Alex and Mike, thanks so much for taking the time out and giving all your knowledge to our audience. We really appreciate it. You guys did great today. Really good stuff. It's a pleasure, and we're excited you to guys. share you and your services, and specifically putting Las Vegas on the map and sharing our clients with you and about learning more about opportunity zones and reinvestment opportunities. So thank you for reaching, for speaking and learning about your, your, you, you as well. Our Excellent. pleasure. It's our pleasure. All right. And, and so, I would say one last thing, if, if I might, that yes. regardless of what you're doing, the most important thing you have to think about is doing due diligence in, in your transaction and making sure that you have the experts helping you on your team to make the right decisions, to do the right investment for your future. And I think Mike and Alex are those experts you need to contact. Yes, yeah, certainly today. There's no question. Okay. All right, everybody, you're We're listening blending. to the Mappable USA podcast over at mappableusa.com. You go to that website, scroll down the homepage, you'll see all our syndication sources. You can pick the one you like best so you never miss another Mappable USA podcast. If you want to be a guest on the show, like Alex and Mike were today, there's a guest tab there. You can just click on that tab, fill it out, and we'll see what we can do about getting you on the show. So everyone out there, thanks for all your support. Thanks for subscribing. Thanks for all your help. And we'll be at you next week with another Mappable USA podcast. Have a great week, everyone.